Hey everyone, so I've got a quick video here for you to review some eye histology. And uh, we have two slides to look at. One of them is the monkey eye and the other one is the human eye. And before we get into it, I just want to make a note about orientation. So uh, I notice a lot of the structures will use terms like inner and outer. And just remember that the reference point for that is actually the center of the globe of the eyeball. So that's why the sclera is considered to be part of the outer shell of the eye. Uh, whereas the retina is part of the inner layer, even though in this particular eye, the left side of the screen is the outside world, and the right side actually goes more in towards the body. So this is the monkey's eye, and a lot of the structures here are better preserved than the other slides, so we'll start with this one. And I'll, work, I'll start from the anterior portion of the eye and then work my way backwards. So up top we have the cornea. It's the most anterior and superficial portion of the eye that interfaces with the air. Uh, behind that, we have the anterior chamber. These two dark pieces here are the iris, and it looks like it's, it's uh, separate, but it's actually one structure that's circular all the way around. It looks like two just because we only see a one a two-dimensional slice. And between the iris and the lens, we have a posterior chamber. And the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber both have aqueous humor. Behind the lens, we have the vitreous body that has vitreous humor. So let's zoom into the cornea and take a closer look. So the outermost structure is the corneal epithelium. Over here is the stratified squamous epithelium. On the inner end of the cornea is the corneal endothelium. This is a simple cuboidal. And sandwiched in the middle, we have a lot of collagen. See all this wavy stuff here? And uh, these nuclei are nuclei of cells that are similar to fibroblasts. Um, the collagen here and the uh, corneal endothelium are derived from neural crest cells. I just wanted to point that out because you know how much they love testing that. And uh, the basement membranes have special names as well. So the corneal epithelium is sitting on the Bowman's membrane, and the corneal endothelium is sitting on Bessemet's membrane. And remember in light microscopy slides, it's really hard to see basement membrane. They're usually pretty uh, tiny structures. You have to go into EM to uh, really see the details. But I think you can probably see how just underneath the epithelium, there's this light uh, staining area that could be the basement membrane. And if we look up here, it's a little fuzzy, but uh, it looks like there's another little light staining piece here. So that would probably be Bowman's. And here's a uh, labeled slide so that you can see the spellings. And now if we follow the cornea back, uh, we can see this is the sclera. It's continuous with the cornea. Um, and you can see it's pretty much a similar material. This is also lots of collagen. And the sclera is what people are referring to when you're talking about the, uh, the white of the eye. And you can see that superficial to the sclera, there's another uh, layer of material. This is the conjunctiva. This is made up of fat and, and connective tissue. And you can see that the stratified squamous uh, corneal epithelium is continuous with it. Uh, this is the thing that gets swollen when you have conjunctivitis. Uh, if you ever looked at the mirror when you've had conjunctivitis, you'll know that notice that the swelling doesn't cover uh, the center portion of the, of the iris or the eye. Uh, that's because it's it's only on this side over on the side, and this junction between the cornea and sclera, the corneal sclera junction, is also called the limbus. And we have another structure down here that looks distinct from the sclera. Uh, this is actually the ciliary body. A lot of it is just uh, made up of smooth muscle, and the ciliary body is what contracts to uh, let your eyes accommodate. So uh, when this contracts, it actually moves closer in towards the lens here. And uh, you can actually see, I believe these are the zonules, the fibers that connect the ciliary body to the lens. Uh, so what happens is if there's an object that gets closer and closer that you're looking at, then the ciliary body is going to contract. It's going to move closer towards the lens. The zonule fibers will, will relax. This will make the lens thicker and rounder um, so you can see it better. And then when you're looking at something that's far away, the ciliary body will relax. It's going to move back uh, outward. This will tighten the zonules, and then this will stretch and uh, thin the lens. And over here, we have the pars plicata, 
which is an epithelium that's uh, connected to the ciliar body here, and this is what produces aqueous humor. So the aqueous humor is produced here, it flows through the posterior chamber, around the iris, and then into the anterior chamber. And you can see from this diagram that the uh, aqueous humor is going to flow into this intersection between the iris, the cornea, and the sclera. And that's where you have this uh, trabecular net, uh, meshwork. So it's a bunch of little holes that the aqueous humor can drain into before going into Schlem's canal. So that area is right here. Uh, it's the iridocorneal angle. So when you've heard about uh, open angle glaucoma or closed angle glaucoma, this is the angle that they're talking about. And remember that open angle glaucoma, it's something that happens with age. Uh, it's very slow, it's a degenerative process. There's an imbalance between how much aqueous humor is being produced and how much uh, it can be drained. Whereas uh, acute closed angle glaucoma is when there's an actual obstruction, so the iris uh, closes in a, like a funny way and will block this off and you have a sudden increase in intraocular pressure. And if we look a little closer, uh, so this is where the trabecular meshwork should be. Um, I'm not really sure if I can see the canal of Schlem here. Uh, it's a little messy. Some of this might just be artifact where it's torn up. I'm not really sure. But I do think it's easier to see in the other slides. So let's take a look at that. And here we have the human eye. So let's zoom in in the iridocorneal angle. Uh, here's the iris. Here's the cornea. Here's the sclera. So the limbus should be around here. And if we zoom in, so this is the uh, angle where the trabecular meshwork should be. And I think the canal of Schlem is some combination of these guys right here. Um, the reason why I say that is, uh, it looks like there is a lot of tearing, that's probably artifact. But if you look closely here, you can actually see, uh, looks like these are nuclei. So I think they're lining an actual, a real lumen here. Um, so, and you can see it over here as well. So I think that might be the canal of Schlem. And uh, I kind of think of it similar to CSF, uh, the way that it drains into uh, the subarachnoid granulations and then into the dural sinuses. So um, it's somewhat analogous to that. And now going back to the monkey's eye, uh, let's talk about the iris and the pupil. So the pupil is this uh, space right here in between the iris. And that's what enlarges or uh, it dilates or it constricts based on how much light is coming in. And uh, there are two very important um, sets of muscles here. So if you look over here, you can see uh, transverse sections of the pupillary uh, constrictor muscle. And if we move uh, closer to the ciliary body, these are longitudinal sections of the pupillary dilator muscle. I think the pupillary dilator muscle is more intuitive, so we'll talk about that first. Um, so these are arranged um, in, a, in a line, right? So when it contracts, it's going to pull uh, the iris over there, so it's going to enlarge the pupil. The pupillary constrictor muscle, on the other hand, is a sphincter, so when it contracts, it's actually going to pull uh, the iris the other way, which it's hard to conceptualize when you're looking at a 2D image like this. So this is a screenshot from uh, Borns and Beyond that I found very helpful for this. So if you uh, think about the slide that we just had, the section, say, let's say it was over here, right? Um, the uh, pupillary dilator muscle that's over here, it's arranged radially. So when it contracts, it pulls uh, the pupil op open this way. But this is a sphincter. So if this was the cut, we saw the transverse sections, right? When it contracts, it um, shrinks this area right here. And this is just showing that since the uh, dilator pupillae muscle is arranged radially, when it contracts, it pulls everything open. And here's a picture with some labels, just about everything we've been talking about. Now let's talk about the lens a little bit. Uh, on the outer surface of the lens, we can see that there's uh, one layer of epithelium. But deep to that, you can see that the others, these are all cells too, but they've lost their nuclei and now the cell bodies are just arranged in this uh, concentric circles uh, around and uh, most of this material is uh, crystalline. 
And it's important to note that the lens is avascular. Uh, so since it doesn't have a blood supply, it relies on diffusion of uh, oxygen and other nutrients uh, from places that do have a blood supply. Uh, the same goes for the cornea. If you look closely, you won't see any uh, blood vessels here. Uh, the sclera is also mostly vascular. There is uh, a layer between the conjunctiva and the sclera called the episclera. Uh, yeah, this was probably right here where you can see uh, some blood. And I just want to point out the ciliary body, uh, just like anywhere else that has muscle, it does have its own uh, vascular supply, and you can see that here. And so let's move towards the posterior portion of the eye now. Um, so I did mention the pars placata, so this is what uh, generates aqueous humor, right, the epithelial cells. And the part of the ciliary body that tapers off as you move posteriorly is the pars plana. And this uh, ciliary epithelium, if we trace it back, we keep going, we're going to get to a point called the aura serrata. So that's going to be right here. And this is the transition point uh, where the retina begins. You can see it's going to start building up three layers. It's a little hard to see here, but at this point, it looks like we already have three layers of uh, nuclei. There's one, two, and three. So this outer layer of nuclei is the outer nuclear layer. This is the inner nuclear layer, and this is the ganglion cell layer. And the ganglion cell layer is what sends the axons into the optic nerve. And next to each of these three uh, nuclear layers, we have um, layers with axons and synapses, and they all have their own names as well. So we can see that better here. So again, here's an outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer, ganglion cell layer. Uh, the ganglion cell layer sends its axons down into the optic nerve through the nerve fiber layer. Uh, they did make a big point about this layer not being myelinated, um, which is a good thing because if it was myelinated, then uh, that would um, affect the light coming through when it would be, uh, wouldn't be as transparent. And in the inner plexiform layer and the outer plexiform, the outer plexiform layer, uh, we have um, a bunch of axons and synapses from the cells here, and we find it. Right. So the outer cell layer is where you have the receptors, the rods and the cones, the photoreceptors. The inner nuclear layer is, uh, has bipolar cells, horizontal cells, endocrine cells, and they're all kind of modulating the signal. And the ganglion cell layer has ganglion cells that are um, sending their axons to the optic nerve. And it's important to note that this arrangement uh, feels kind of backwards uh, because the light actually has to travel through all of these layers and to get to the outer layer where the uh, photoreceptors are, and that will send the signals back up here before coming back down into the optic nerve. And it's important to note that on the peripheral retina, so around here, um, you're going to have a high sensitivity but low acuity. So there's um, uh, the photoreceptors out here are going to be almost entirely rods. So um, compared to the fovea, uh, where you're going to have um, low sensitivity but high acuity, where you're going to have almost entirely cones. So the fovea, if it was in the slide, should be somewhere around here, I believe, if you uh, look directly past the lens here. I don't think it's actually in this slide. Um, it should look something like this. Right, so there should be like a little pit here uh, where there's very few ganglion cells. And the reason is it, it, the fovea, which is where you uh, have um, your sharpest focus, you don't want the ganglion cells getting in the way of the light getting through. And over here, you can have a very high concentration of uh, cones relative to rods. And the outermost layer of the retina that we need to point out is the retinal pigmented epithelium. It's this tiny little layer here. It's made up of one layer of cells. So if we look over here, um, it's, it's deep to the uh, outer cellular layer. So it looks like this is your retinal pigmented epithelium. Right, so even though this area here uh, carries a lot of pigments, I don't think that's the RPE. This is probably the choreocapillaris. 
uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I think it's, it's actually easier to see the RPE in the uh, other slide, so let's take a look at that. And this is the slide of the human eye again. And you can see a lot of the retina is, is kind of detached over here, unfortunately. Uh, that's an artifact. But it actually is conveniently detached uh, right at where we want to look at. So if we look at the layers, uh, the nuclear layers of the retina again. Here's the ganglion cell layer, the inner nuclear layer, and the outer nuclear layer. And where it detached, remember that what's deep to the, or what's outside of the outer nuclear layer is the RPE. So that's actually this. You see the single layer of cells that has little granules. This is the retinal pigment and epithelium. And uh, these granules are absorbing stray light to protect the retina. And just like any other epithelium in the body, you would expect it to have its basement membrane, right? So this basement membrane is actually extremely important. It's called the Brux membrane. And you can see it here, it's actually pretty thick, this uh, pink band uh, that the RPE is sitting on. And this is the membrane where uh, if you have a disruption in the membrane, uh, blood can get in here, and that's what uh, wet macular degeneration is. And just past Brux membrane, you have the choroid, uh, which is this layer here with all this vasculature. It's providing all the nutrients for the retina. And actually, the uh, layer that's immediately past the Brux membrane is the chorio capillaris, which is this tiny layer of capillaries that's right next to the Brux membrane. And now before we get to the last part, which is the head of the optic nerve, I want to talk about layers because that's really important. Uh, so the inner layer we were just talking about, that's the retina, which is composed of the neural retina uh, plus the RPE. The middle layer is the, called the uvea. It's the iris, which is continuous with the ciliary body which becomes, which is uh, continuous with the choroid. Okay, so uvea is iris, ciliary body, and choroid. And the outer, outer layer, as we mentioned before, is the cornea, which is continuous with the sclera. And the sclera becomes continuous with the lamina cribrosa, which is in the optic nerve. So let's take a closer look. Uh, so like I mentioned before, uh, these are all the axons from the ganglion layer. They're converging onto the optic nerve. Uh, so this is where the blind spot would be in your vision. And if we just quickly review what the layers here are, so we have the outer cellular layer, RPE. Here's the choroid. This is sclera. And the sclera is continuous with the lamina cribrosa. If you look closely, you can see these um, fibers going across horizontally over here. That's what the lamina cribrosa is. So unlike the sclera that's very tightly packed with collagen, uh, the collagen here is going to be more of a meshwork. It's going to have, um, if you can imagine, like little holes inside the meshwork of collagen where the axons can go through. And this meshwork of lamina cribrosa uh, with the axons going through, it's tight enough so that uh, the oligodendrocytes that are myelinating um, the axons over here can't get through and uh, won't be myelinating uh, any of the axons up here. And other than that, um, I guess we can take a look at these structures here. Um, so these are actually skeletal muscle, it looks like. Um, you have the eccentric nuclei, I can't really see striations, but um, maybe. Uh, this looks like a middle nerve, so this is probably an extraocular uh, muscle, and this is one of the, uh, might be one of the cranial nerves. And I'll put this here just in case you want to see the spelling of lamina cribosa. And that's pretty much it. So I uh, hope this was helpful, and let me know if you have any questions.